guys. Uh, welcome back to this online certification course on watershed hydrology. I am Rajendra Singh, professor in the Department of Agriculture and Food Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. And we are in module one. This is lecture number three. The topic is rain ball, rainfall data analysis, part one. In this uh, uh, lecture, we will talk about uh, the presentation of rainfall data, the consistency of rainfall record and estimation of uh, mean rainfall. Now coming to presentation of rainfall data, if you remember in the previous lecture we discussed about measurement of rainfall and we said that typically instrument called rain gauge which is of two types recording and non-recording. Uh, Non-recording is Simon's rain gauge, recording is uh, uh, float type uh, or sif siphon type, then we have weighing bucket or we have a tipping bucket type of rain gauge. So these rain gauges besides radar and satellites are used for measuring rainfall. Now once uh, rainfall data is measured typically in our country say India meteorological department, then the data has to be of course preserved and uh, presented in certain form. Now, one of the most common ways of uh, preserving or presenting rainfall data is in the form of mass curve, which is basically a plot of accumulated rainfall against time. That is, here you can see this is the uh, this is a mass curve of rainfall, and as you can see here, accumulated precipitation in millimeters is uh, is plotted against time in hours. Now, as you can see here. The, basically it shows that it is a cumulative rainfall that means shows that there was a storm in which rainfall occurred and here it shows that this was the first storm which had a rainfall of 16 mm and then the horizontal line shows that during uh, this period there was uh, no rainfall, no rainfall, no rainfall event that means no rainfall occurred between 20 and 40 hours. Then there, there was a second event uh, which goes here and that resulted in a storm of around uh, uh, rainfall of around 32 mm and then subsequently there is no rainfall. So that is how we keep the record either uh, weekly or daily or uh, basically daily or weekly data is recorded. And incidentally we also saw that typically this weighing bucket type of rainfall as well as the siphon type or float type of rain gauge. Uh, bucket weighing bucket type of rain gauge as well as siphon type of rain gauge, they automatically produce a uh, mass curve. That is the, uh, the so that is why it is one of the common ways of preserving rainfall data. Another way of preserving rainfall data is the form of hydrograph, which is basically a bar chart representing rainfall intensity versus time. So, here you can see that uh, rainfall intensities are there and there is a time in hours and of course because it is a bar chart so we have to take uh, the time slices. So here 8 hour slices are there so 0 to 8 hours, 8 to 16 hours and so on and uh, of course the area under a particular bar if you try to find out the area that will give us the amount of rainfall that occurred over 8 hours that is in this particular uh, slice or bar and if we, if we do so for the entire period then we will get the total depth of rainfall which comes out to be 10.6 millimeter in this case over 48 hours period. So, this is 0 to 48 hours and 10.6 millimeters of rainfall occurred. And basically this uh, hydrograph is derived from mass curve and uh, 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 you may wonder why it is uh, presenting in such a complex fashion. So, obviously this hydrograph has a very significant role. And when we come in future lectures, when we discuss our hydrograph or even uh, average infiltration rate, then we will see the application of these hydrographs also in future. Another way of uh, preserving the rainfall uh, data uh, is uh, in the form of uh, depth area duration curve. So basically as you can see, it is uh, here the depth of rainfall that average rainfall depth versus area is plotted for different durations of rainfall. So these two hour storms, three hour storm, they simply show the duration of the storm. So aerial distribution characteristics of a storm of a given duration is reflected in its depth area relationship. So as you can see that uh, depth, area and 
stop, uh, duration, all three is shown here. And uh, typically, if we talk about depth area relationship, then for a rainfall of a given duration, the average depth decreases with the area in an exponential fashion, which is given by this form, where uh, p bar is the average depth of rainfall over the area, p0 is the highest amount of rainfall which is at the storm center, and k and r constants and a is of course the area. Now, as you can see that uh, average depth decreases with the area in an exponential fashion, which we can see here also, the average depth decreases uh, with the area as you can see that for as the area increases, the depth of rainfall is, is, is in decreasing exponentially. Following this relationship, the average rainfall depth decreases exponential with the area of rainfall of different durations. So, as you can see here, different duration. Of course, when the duration of the rainfall is more, the ma magnitude of total rainfall will be higher, but as far as uh, depth versus area is concerned, it decreases exponentially and this is how uh, this uh, depth area duration curve, uh, the data is projected in the form of depth area duration curve. Then uh, uh, we come to the consistency of rainfall record and basically the consistency of rainfall record is analyzed using double mass curve and uh, uh, this is a uh, double mass curve is the consistency in a station record is checked by plotting the double mass curve. So, if you whenever we take the data of a particular station and, and as a part of quality analysis, we want to find out whether the data of a station are consistent or not consistent over a period of time over the period of record. So, that is uh, that analysis we can do by plotting the double mass curve and here the cumulative annual rainfall of the station is plotted against the average annual, annual rainfall of neighboring stations in a reverse chronological order. So, as we saw that we in a catchment we can have several number of rain gauges installed. We saw that we typically design rain gauge network. So, suppose for example, we have a station here and we want to analyze the data of this particular station. Let us say we call it x. Then obviously, in order to carry out this consistent analysis, what we do, we collect the data of all the neighboring stations and then uh, for plotting this double mass curve, the cumulative annual rainfall of this particular station x, which is here, cumulative annual rainfall at the station for which we are analyzing, is plotted against the average annual rainfall of neighboring stations. So, we collect the data of neighboring stations, find out the average annual rainfall and then the cumulative of that, that is cumulative average annual rainfall of neighboring stations is plotted here, as you can see in this plot. Now, uh, if the data are consistent, then it is expected that they will follow uh, a straight line relationship here, I mean 45 degree line uh, they will follow. But a change in, if there is a change in slope of the line, that indicates inconsistency. So, if the slope of the line changes of the data, that shows that the data are not consistent. And if you look at a figure, it shows that the station data is inconsistent because you can see that there is the, the slope of the line here and the slope of line here is different. And the slope of the line changes in 1995. So, that is the period of time that shows the year in which the inconsistency has occurred. That means the data prior to 1995 and data following 1995, they follow a different trend or different pattern. And uh, basically, uh, important point is that why do we plot this in reverse chronological order? We plot the, in the reverse chronological order, that means the latest data first and oldest data at the last, simply because uh, that in it is expected that in future we will be following the same instrument and same location and same data trend will be followed. So, what we do in double mass curve when we, we correct the data, we try to bring the inconsistent data in tune with the current trend and that is why we pl plot the data in reverse chronological order and then try to see whether data are consistent or not. And inconsistency in rainfall record may arise due to changes in the instrument, changes in the rain gauge location are due to changes in the surrounding environment. So, for example, uh, at a particular station, if the rain gauge was malfunctioning and the instrument itself was changed. So,
So, because of the change of the, of the instrument, the um, recording pattern might have changed or if there, there might be a slight shift in the rain gauge location for some uh, 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 regions and if the location is changed, then of course, because the environment is changed, so uh, the uh, uh, rainfall trend might change. And also due to change in the surrounding environment, that means suppose a, a location where rain gauge is there, but sudden, suddenly a nearby place, a, a tall building has come or a new tree has grown. So, because of the changes in the surrounding condition also, the data may become consistent. And uh, basically, uh, in order to correct the data, what we do is that we try to find the slope of the line, this slope of this line o a, o a, which is x by y, similarly slope of the line a c, which is a by b and then we find the correction factor s o a by s o b, that is slope of the, uh, the two lines is used as a correction factor and then rainfall data prior to 1995 has to be multiplied by the correction factor. I think things will be very clear when we see an example. So, let us take an example here and uh, uh, that uh, example is the given the annual rainfall at station M and the average rainfall at various neighboring stations near M in table 1, use the double mask curve to check the consistency of the rainfall data at station M. Compute the corrected rainfall at station M if the data are inconsistent. So, this is here the table where rainfall uh, at station M in millimeters the annual rainfall and average rainfall at various neighboring stations near M that is average rainfall in millimeters they are tabulated here. Now, data are from 1993 to 2023, but incidentally the data are already put in the reverse chronological order as you remember that double mask curve we always plot in reverse chronological order. So, if the data are not uh, in reverse chronological order we need to really put, but in this uh, example that is already put in a reverse chronological order. Now, as we, as we saw in double mask curve that we need to plot the cumulative annual rainfall of station against the cumulative average rainfall of neighboring stations. So, first thing we have to do is we get the cumulative rainfall at station M. So, it is basically nothing but the cumulative data of uh, this column. So, first value of course, remains 612 second value is sum of these two value that is 612 plus 426 which is 1038 and so on. Similarly, uh, the p sum p average millimeter which is the cumulative average rainfall of neighboring station that comes uh, from summing up of cumulative uh, cum uh, values of this uh, average, average rainfall value. So, first value here is 588, the second value will be sum of these two that is 998. The third value of course, will again be a lead 787 to get 1785 and so on. So, cumulative values are calculated. And then of course, uh, we plot the graph between the cumulative annual rainfall of station M and cumulative mean rainfall value of neighboring stations in reverse chronological order. So, this is how we get the graph. So, if you plot the graph uh, between cumulative annual rainfall at station M and neighboring station mean rainfall then this is what you graph we get and this is referred to as double mask curve. Now, you we have to analyze whether the data are consistent or not and if we, we say that if data are consistent then all the data will follow the 45 degree line that means there will be no change in the slope of the line anywhere. But as you can see here this is the point where the slope of the line changes that means between O and A and A and C the slope of the line are uh, uh, not same they change. So, 2000 year uh, 2011 year 2011 is the year where uh, the slope of the line changes that means station data become inconsistent. So, that simply means what that whatever data we have prior to 2011 that needs to be corrected and for that we need to find out the correction factor and that is uh, already we saw that is a ratio of the slopes of the two lines. So, we will fit a uh, straight line here I have used Excel to fit the lines and that is why these are the Excel generated equations. So, for OA this is the equation. So, the slope comes out to be 
171 which is shown here and for this part A to C the slope is uh, 0 0.8774 and so the slope of the line SAC is 0.8774. So, correction factor is the ratio of these two SOA by SAC that comes out to be 1.16. So, this is the correction factor. So, all the data prior to 2011 has to be multiplied by this correction factor in order to bring that in tune with the current trend of recording at uh, this particular station. Uh, so, that is what it is written here rainfall data prior to 2000 has to be multiplied by the correction factor. Now, there could be a case this is a typical case in both the figures I showed, but the this line could also be like this. So, in that case also we have to uh, find the uh, slope uh, correction factor and in that case of course, uh, this, uh, this data uh, will be again multiplied uh, to bring in tune with the uh, line A B. So, this could also be a case it is not necessary that always it will go below 45 degree line. So, uh, so uh, we final values of if you look at the PM. So, that means for the station uh, prior to 2011 we will net need to get the fresh values. So, prior to 2011 data is multiplied by this factor 1.16. And uh, in this table, uh, the PM value in 2010 uh, is 999. So, that has to be multiplied that will be 1158.84 and in fact, all the data prior to that up to 1993 that has to be multiplied and uh, by 1.16 in order to get the corrected data. So, this is the corrected data or consistent data which we will be using in our uh, further analysis. Now, we come to estimation of uh, mean rainfall, uh, uh, which is uh, basically uh, in a rain gauge, we, uh, in a catchment we saw that there are multiple rain gauges. So, uh, and, and the rainfall which is recorded is these stations is referred to as point rainfall. So, this is point rainfall data which we call. So, at a particular station whatever data we get, we refer to that as a point rainfall. So, any registration data if you take it will be a point rainfall, uh, but uh, uh, we need to get a probably a representative value the mean value for the entire catchment. So, that in that case we have to convert the point rainfall at various stations into an average over the basin and the commonly used methods uh, we adopt are there are four arithmetic average method, Thesian's polygon method, isohydral method and two axis method and we will discuss these methods one by one. Now, let us uh, uh, start with arithmetic average method and uh, uh, as the name itself suggests it is a, a simplest method that is where we just take the arithmetic average of all the point records, but there is a condition that this method is used or could be used when the area is hydrologically homogeneous and the rain gauges are uniformly distributed over the catchment. So, uh, the first condition is that the hydrological behavior of the catchment uh, should be uniform throughout. Uh, so, obviously, there are ways of finding out whether the, uh, with the, whether the area is hydrological homogeneous or not that we have to find out. And then of course, we uh, another condition is that rainfall should be uniformly distributed over the catchment to represent uh, the data of all parts of the uh, rain uh, of the catchment. So, if these conditions are met then simply an arithmetic or average of the values recorded various stations give the mean rainfall of the basin. So, R bar is nothing but uh, 1 by n i 1 to n R i where R bar is the mean rainfall uh, aerial rainfall, R i the rainfall is station i. So, sum of all the stations will be taking and dividing by the number of rain gauge stations. So, basically uh, it arithmetic average method each institution is given equal weight. So, that and weight come is by 1 by n. So, basically it is nothing but 1 by n is nothing but uh, the weight assigned to a different uh, a to each of the uh, stations. So, let us take an example here and uh, uh, in a year the annual rainfall at different stations in an area are given below. Determine the mean annual rainfall of the area. So, there are 4 stations R1, R2, R3, R4 and recorded rainfalls in the year are 802,000, 1806 and 1103. 
So obviously, uh, 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 we presume uh, or you assume that uh, the area is hydrological homogeneous and the rain gauges are uniformly distributed. And in that case, we can simply take an arithmetic average of the values. So, some value divided by the number of rain gauge stations will give us the average value which is 1180 millimeters. So, mean rain rainfall, rainfall, mean aerial rainfall of the area using arithmetic average method comes out to be 1100. 80 mm by this particular method. Now, the next method is uh, Thijan polygon method, which is one of the most popular methods for estimating the mean and real rainfall. In fact, most of the computer software also use this method. Uh, so, here polygons defining the area represented by various rain gauge stations are created by drawing perpendicular bisectors to the line joining the rain gauge stations. We will see the detailed procedure in the next slide. And then the mean annual rainfall is estimated using the following equation 1 by A, uh, sum of uh, I 1 to an A i R i, where R i is the rainfall station, uh, at a station, area represented by I uh, station i is A i, and n is the number of rain gauge stations. So, in this case, basically, um, A i by sum of that is A, that is sum of which is nothing but sum of A i h that gives the weighing factor for the particular station. That means the weights are assigned based on the area of the polygon uh, represented within the particular catchment. Now, coming to procedure, what we do is that we draw the catchment area to a scale and mark the rain gauge stations on it. So, he, as you can see here, he, we have six rain gauge stations A to F and marked here. Some of the stations, the neighbor, stations may be outside the catchment boundary. Now, what we do is we join each station by straight line, uh, which is a solid line shown here to create a triangular network. So, as you can see that there is a triangular network created. Next, what we do is that we draw perpendicular bisectors, which is shown here is a blue color dashed line on each triangle and they extend the bisectors to meet other bisectors and the catchment boundary. So, we, we draw these perpendicular bisectors uh, like here and here and here and then we also extend so that they cut each other and also the catchment boundary here and here and so on. So, that is the procedure followed in each case. Now, these, these bisectors form polygon around each station. So, as you can see for station A here this is the polygon. So, that is the area being represented by station A. So, these poly, these bisectors form polygon around each station. The area of polygon gives the area represented by the station. An area may be calculated using a planimeter or by converting the area into a smallest geological or you can use a graph sheet. You can plot this entire thing in a graph sheet and get the representative value. For stations close to the catchment boundary, the boundary lines form the closing limit of the uh, polygon. So, this is important because for station E in this case, uh, though it is outside, so basically this is the area. So, catchment boundary forms the uh, limit uh, for this area. So, this area which is uh, within the polygon, but bounded by the catchment boundary on one side that is that is representative for station E. Let us take an example, estimate the average precipitation using Thijan polygon method. So, there are stations, these are the rainfall recorded on these stations. So, as uh, we have discussed, we will create the Thijan polygon, Thijan polygon network and we will extend and then we will find the uh, find the area that is represented uh, representative of different stations and then we will find out the catchment area. So, here for example, station A, uh, the area represented by station A is 72 square kilometers. Then, of course, we multiply the area and the catchment uh, rainfall, area and rainfall uh, to get area into rainfall. And uh, average precipitation, we know that summation of area into this rainfall divided by total area. So, if we sum these values, we get 2572.6, and if we sum the area, then we will get a value of 344 square kilometers. So, average precipitation comes out to be 7. 4, 7 millimeters by this method. Then uh, we come to the uh, last method that is the isohydral method, the third method in fact, isohydral method. 
So, isohydrates are the lines joining the points of equal rainfall magnitudes and isohydrates are drawn by interpolating the point rainfall data. So, basically uh, these are this is what isohydrates are and we will see the procedure and uh, the mean annual rainfall is estimated using the volume equation that means the area uh, uh, area includes in between two isohydrates that is we found out and of course the average of the two stations within which the area has been measured that is taken into account and the sum of that uh, divided by total area gives us the average rainfall and this use method is useful in hilly terrains basically it is uh, more useful in hilly terrains. So, let us take an example here. Uh, so, uh, procedure draw the catchment area to the scale and mark the rain stations, gain stations on it. So, that is what we have done here. We have uh, uh, the catchment area and the rain gauge are marked here uh, with the recorded rainfall values. Put the recorded rainfall values of rainfall at the station for the period of interest. So, that is what we have done here. Uh, maybe it, we can say this is a daily rainfall. Draw the isohydrates of various values by considering the point rainfall data at guidelines and interpolation between them. So, for here say for example, for uh, in order to draw this 3 mm uh, isohyd, we of course, need some surrounding points which is not seen, but we have to have some data otherwise we cannot draw. But say for example, we want to draw 4 mm. So, obviously, the 4 mm value is already recorded here, but then we can between 3 and 5, we can interpolate and find out where, where 5 lies between 3 and 5.5, we can interpolate and 5 of where 5 li uh, 4 lies between 3 and 6, we can interpolate and find out where uh, 4 lies, even we can use this data 3 and 6.5 to interpolate where 4 lies. So, we get in that way by interpolation, we get enough points to be able to draw the iso height of a uh, known value. So, that is what uh, we have drawn here. So, 4 similarly, we will draw 5, 6, 7, 8 and so uh, that is how we for the given area we, uh, we will draw the iso heights uh, of different values. And then what we do is the determine the area between each pair of iso heights. So, that means between 6 and 7 if you have to do then we will find out the area between 6 and 7 so on and so on and either by planimeter or by converting the areas into smaller geometric, geometrical shapes or even if you can uh, use a, a graph sheet uh, uh, and if you have enough large size of graph sheet is available. Uh, then let us take an example or problem on isohydral method. Use the isohydral method to determine the average precipitation depth within the basin for the storm. This is the storm which is given here and for which uh, uh, the iso heights are already given and uh, the iso height interval is given here the average rainfall values between the iso height that is between 10 and 20 the average rainfall will be 15 20 and 20 30 it will be 25 and so on and then what we have to do of course we have to find out the catchment area so for a2 for example uh, that is between 20 and 30 this is the area we have to find out for uh, this one, uh, we have to of course, only find the area which lies within the basin. So, A1, A2 and so on will measure this area. Then area into rainfall that means um, area, area is there, average rainfall is there that we will multiply and then we can obviously get the sum of the values. So, sum of uh, this uh, is 16,830 that is sum of, sum of these values and the total area of the catchment uh, is here and average uh, div div division of that will get the average uh, aerial rainfall of the basin which comes out to be 39.3 mm. So, uh, with this uh, we uh, close this uh, lecture today. Thank you very much for your uh, listening and uh, uh, please uh, feel free to give your feedback and also raise questions on the forum so that we can be answered. Thank you very much.